We're at Walter Sutton's field in the trusty 152 and I'm going to tell you about the CH Eclipse yoke. In fact most of what I say will also apply to the CH flight yoke which is the cheaper version as the internal mechanisms are identical. The difference is that the Eclipse has all sorts of extra buttons and knobs and switches and I'll point out some of those things as we go along. But fundamentally this yoke's purpose is to fly the aircraft in pitch and roll and to this end it's built around two analog axes to control the ailerons and elevators. Like its little brother it also has three analog axes in the form of these levers on top of the casing intended for use as throttle, prop and mixture controls. Now you'll notice I'm not using those here because I've got two Cytec throttle quadrants running alongside the yoke but I can still use these axes for other things for example I can have an analog spoiler control for flying gliders or I could set up a lever to control elevator trim or flaps and so on. In one other significant difference from the cheaper yoke, the Eclipse has a sixth analog axis manipulated by this rather peculiar paddle arrangement on the yoke. This is a self-centering axis and it's clearly intended for use as a rudder control, although its design doesn't seem well conceived. It's designed for two-handed use, which doesn't really fit with how you fly a light aircraft. In most situations where rudder control is critical, so take off and landing for example, you'll need one hand on the throttle, so operating the rudder with this control is going to be fiddly at best, and in practice you're better off with pedals for controlling the rudder. But it's a free axis and perhaps you can find other uses for it. So the yoke operates the two main control surfaces, or all three if you choose to use the rudder paddles, but we need some way to set the elevator trim. Now we have a number of different options with the Eclipse, but most likely we want to use the little wheel that's mounted on the face of the yoke. This is a rotary control that's oriented like the elevator trim control in many light aircraft, although it's not usually positioned on the yoke itself. In this aircraft it's on the bottom of the console here, but it operates just the same. We wind it upwards or forwards for nose down trim and downwards, backwards in other words for nose up trim. This control has no concept of position, it's not a potentiometer, it's just a wheel that rotates freely and it generates electrical pulses by interrupting a light beam. In use it has a nice slightly clicky action which makes changing trim settings fairly precise. So this wheel generates a single button event for every click and that's a different button for each direction obviously. So it's a simple matter to bind it to the elevator trim functions. One slight glitch with this kind of control is that if you spin it too quickly you can get a spurious button press in the opposite direction but in practice it's not a big deal. So that's how best to set the elevator trim. You can operate this wheel with your thumb just about uh, depending on how big your hands are <laughs> obviously and assuming you fly with your left hand on the yoke as you would from the captain's seat. There's also another rotary control oriented at 90 degrees to this one and you can use that for controlling rudder trim which you'll find on twin engine aircraft. We don't have rudder trim in the 152. Now these rotary controls are unique to the Eclipse so if you have the cheaper yoke you'll need to set the trim some other way. Now if you've used an earlier CH yoke or a Cytec Pro Flight yoke you'll quickly notice that the shaft on this yoke is free floating in both pitch and roll. In other words there's no central notch or detente in either axis. This feels much more like a real aircraft and it means there's no mechanical interference with fine control around the central position. This is important for making precise turns and uh, especially if you're flying lots of procedure turns under IFR. Another difference which might not be immediately obvious is that although the aileron axis centers itself perfectly to zero, the elevator axis doesn't and there's actually a bit of imprecision built in. This isn't a fault and if you check out the frequently asked questions on the CH website you'll see it's a deliberate design feature that makes the yoke work more like it does in a real aircraft. What this means in practice is that for any given trim setting you can make minor adjustments in pitch by pushing or pulling the yoke and it'll stay where you put it within about an inch or so of travel. Incidentally the discrete rotary control sighted on the body of the yoke off to the left of the shaft isn't intended as a flight control. Uh, its purpose is to adjust the centre position of the pitch axis and of that bit of mechanical slack and that's going to prove useful later. So in use the yoke feels very smooth and precise. It has a weighty substantial construction except for a slight flexing where the yoke sits on the shaft. People have criticised this yoke because the shaft's made of plastic but it is very rigid and it appears quite up to the job. It's worth noting that CH Products has been making yokes like this since the 1980s and I can personally testify to the binding problem they had with the original Virtual Pilot yoke which also had a plastic shaft running on nylon bearings. 
point is they sorted that out and it's now a mature technology with a successful track record. I just want to point out one consequence of that free floating design and that's that it's very hard to fly a straight approach unless you literally take your hand off the yog because the aileron control is sensitive to every slight twitch. In practice I've found it's vital to set a null zone in the aileron control either using the FSX interface or FSUIPC if you use that. I'm not going to say too much about the various buttons and switches. There's not a lot to say, except uh, there are lots of them. I will just mention uh, this three-position dial on the front of the yoke, another extra that's absent from the basic flight yoke. This essentially holds down button 24, 25 or 26, depending on which position you set it to. Now that means with the right software you can treat it as a kind of a three-position shift key, so effectively trebling the number of buttons on the yoke. You'll only be able to use this feature if you have the CH Control Manager software installed or a suitable alternative. It is worth noting here that most sophisticated flight simmers generally recommend that you don't install any of the software that comes with an input device such as this because it can lead to all sorts of conflicts and indeed CH Products makes a point of the Eclipse's driverless installation capability. But if you have a registered version of FSU IPC you can make use of all the functions of this yoke. OK, so far so good, but what else can I tell you? Well, it's not all good news. This yoke may have a nice, firm and positive feel, but that's only half the story. You probably notice it feels quite heavy when you rotate for the takeoff. And uh, in fact, if you forget to set the takeoff trim, it might even turn into a bit of a disaster. And if you try pulling that yoke all the way back, or pushing it all the way forward, you're going to find it very hard work. Don't forget you'll usually be doing this with one hand particularly during the takeoff and landing when your other hand's on the throttle and it's a problem. It's not a small problem either, in fact it's almost a deal breaker you might say. Now I'm not the first person to suggest that the springs in this yoke are too strong and I'm not going to take the credit. What I am going to do is explain why it's a problem. In almost all phases of flight we operate this yoke over about a quarter of its range in the pitch axis and under these circumstances it works just fine. But in a very few circumstances and by far most importantly during the landing we use a much wider range and we may even approach full deflection of the elevators during the landing flare. What's more in the flare and in controlling the subsequent float until touchdown we need the most precise subtle and rapid pitch adjustment of any of our flying and if you imagine all of this with the yoke operating far back in that Arnold Schwarzenegger region you'll begin to appreciate the problem. Here's a passably competent landing and if you watch the elevators and the yoke you'll see the kind of subtle inputs required. And this by the way with a docile aircraft in calm conditions. We try and land something like a pit special or a Waco taper wing in gusty conditions. You can imagine it's a different order of magnitude again. Out of the box the Eclipse is barely capable of this kind of subtle control and it's not realistic. So what can we do? Well there are let's say four different things we can do to mitigate this problem or perhaps three as the first two are really different versions of the same thing and only one of these things really fixes it. So first if you have a registered copy of FSU IPC you can go into the calibration page for the elevator axis and map the output to only part of the physical input range. To do this you set the center point as normal but press the outer set buttons with the yoke pulled only part way back or pushed part way forwards. For example you might choose about half of its possible range of travel. This means you get the maximum possible output or full elevator deflection when the yoke is pulled about halfway from the center to its fully back position. Of course now it's going to feel more sensitive and you might want to set the slope profile for the pitch axis to adjust the feel. If you don't have FSU IPC you can achieve similar results in the Windows calibration dialog for the yoke, although it's a bit more fiddly. When it asks you to move the yoke in circles what you should actually do is wiggle the ailerons fully from side to side and then pull and push the yoke only to the limits you've chosen for the pitch deflection. It helps here if you click the show raw data box so you can see a numeric indication of the deflection. This is less flexible and you can't tinker with the slope setting but it does change the yoke's pitch behavior to require less muscle power. Incidentally there's also a parameter you can adjust in the FSX config file that affects the scaling of joystick inputs. By default FSX varies the output as a non-linear function of the input, a bit like FSUIPC's slope function, although not modifiable. You can turn this behavior off by setting stick sensitivity mode equals zero in the controls section of fsx.cfg 
so that's something else to experiment with. The third way of attacking this yoke's control heaviness is probably the simplest and it is quite effective. If you remember that trim wheel, not the elevator trim, the one that's mounted on the yoke body to the left of the shaft, you just want to wind that as far back or downwards as it will go. It only moves about a half an inch or so in total, but just make sure it's fully down. What this does is it sets the potentiometer range for the pitch axis so it's off-center. In other words, when the yoke is centered mechanically, it's actually reading as if it's pulled a substantial amount of the way back. And this is great because what it means is we can operate close to that full up elevator position while staying more or less out of the Schwarzenegger zone. But it is at a price. We need to rely much more on aggressive forward elevator trim to establish normal attitudes. And in technical terms, this means we're achieving any given pitch angle for the aircraft in an aerodynamically different way than if we were using the yoke properly. This is because we'll have a steeply deflected trim tab. Now this is a subtle point and I don't know enough about FSX flight modeling to know if it makes a difference. What I do know though is we can no longer trust any of the elevator trim indicators in the virtual cockpit. We're also going to find that different aircraft have different sensitivity to elevator trim and some aircraft don't have it at all. We can edit elevator trim sensitivity for an individual aircraft in its aircraft.cfg but it's another compromise and fiddly. And finally, of course, by effectively shifting the centre position of the yoke backwards, we're making it even harder to achieve large downward deflections of the elevators. The consequences of this will depend on what kind of flying you do, but it is still a departure from realism. So all of these approaches are compromises in one way or another. And in case you haven't guessed it, the only way we can really fix this problem, in other words, retain the full resolving power of the pitch axis and a realistic degree of movement in the yoke, is to open it up and fiddle with those springs. Now this isn't hard to do. If you're capable of undoing eight screws, then that's about as hard as it gets. The design of this yoke is such that these two springs supply the tension in both pitch and roll. And this gives us another variable to play with. Now the absolute simplest thing you can do is to open up the yoke and just pop one of these springs off and put it back together and it'll fly very differently. In practice that makes it a little bit too sloppy. So here's what to do. Replace the spring you've just removed with something a little bit less chunky. It's worth experimenting to see what works for you. This one works great for me. Of course we also need to be mindful of the consequences of our tinkering. And I'm not just talking about invalidating the warranty. Something I just let go by without comment a minute ago was that by replacing the springs with lighter ones we're also going to affect the aileron action, essentially making it lighter as well. Although this is largely a matter of feel, it's also going to affect that hair trigger aileron control effect, leading to even more squirrely approaches unless we make sure we design a null zone in. A more subtle consequence of the design, which should be apparent once you open up the yoke and see how the spring action works, is that lighter springs are going to expand that zone of imprecision in the centering of the pitch axis. Um, just how much it expands will depend on how much lighter the springs are after we finish tinkering, and at some point it would become intolerable because there wouldn't be sufficient centering at all, and this would negate the effects of setting elevator trim. In practice, I've found that it is possible to lighten the spring action significantly whilst retaining enough of that centering action to make the yoke flyable. Now, I've done some experiments to put numbers to this by way of comparison. So in the 152, power off with 20 degrees of flaps. The standard yoke shows a speed difference of around 6 knots between the forwardmost and the aftmost hands-off positions of the pitch axis. The speeds I recorded were respectively about 70 and 76 knots, although the actual speeds will vary depending on the position of that trim wheel. With the replacement springs I'm currently using, this rises to a 10 knot difference, varying between 69 and 79 knots. Although that sounds like quite a big difference, in practice I've found that I do tend to centre the yoke by feel somewhere between the two extremes. So actually the trimming action still gives fairly precise control over the speed. And that's about it really. Overall impressions of this yoke, it's a solid piece of engineering with some compromises, but once you get it set up it works well. Is it worth going for the Eclipse over the cheaper flight yoke? That really depends on what other hardware you have. There is a significant price difference and essentially you're paying for extra buttons and switches. Ergonomically, the Eclipse is a bit of a mixed bag. I've already talked about that rudder paddle, but the hand grip mouldings have big protrusions just under where your thumbs sit, and these are kind of in the way of the paddles. The two flipper switches on the yoke body are kind of hard to get at, and they could do with being mounted higher or lower, and so on. 
So is it worth buying? Well, I think so, but your mileage may vary. There's a real temptation to look at a device like this and draw inferences about its quality from the price. My experiences with flight sim hardware tell a different story, and you're always going to find there are compromises, regardless of how much you paid. I'm not sure I'd recommend this yoke unless you're prepared to open it up and tinker with the springs, but with a little bit of effort it can easily be made pliable. 